Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service here at Netley Christian Fellowship. It's lovely to see you all this morning, and a particular welcome to you if you are visiting us today. Um, just, uh, well, I say just a few. There's quite a few notices this morning and uh, things to make you aware of before we, we start our, our time of worship together. Um, first of all, let's start with the here and now. So um, Paul, our pastor, is going to be coming up shortly to, to preach to us. And uh, we're just chatting before we, we came in this morning. And it's, um, what have we got? Two more sermons after this one on Galatians. So we are coming towards the end of Galatians. And um, it's, a, it's a big finale as we come into the last chapter this morning. So uh, we're looking forward to that. And uh, like I said, Paul will be coming up to, to preach and share with us God's word later. Um, after that, uh, but still at the, the end of this morning service, we have our communion service. Um, so if you know Jesus Christ as your own Lord and Savior, you are very welcome to stay and take of the bread and wine. If that's not you, you're still very welcome to stay, but we just ask that you let the bread and wine pass by. There are the Sunday school and uh, creche this morning as normal, so again, I think it'll be after the, the third hymn. When everyone else moves, if, if you're new and you want your children to go to that, then just, just follow the children out and that will take place during the sermon. Tonight... There is also the rooted meeting after the evening service for the young people. That's taking place at the Hallies. So if you speak to Adam or Emily, they will be able to tell you a bit more about that. On Wednesday, we have a special meeting. Um, we have Hamida from Sholing Baptist coming to speak to us about the work in Niger. He's known to, to many of us here. So if you are able to come along to that, then please do. John Singleton has issued a three-line whip, as always, as a missionary meeting, um, so do please um, come along if you can. A couple of other things just to flag up. Next Sunday is Remembrance Sunday, and again, if you're a regular here, you'll know that that adds extra complexity in trying to get into the car park, internetly, because there is often a march going on. Um, it may be best just kind of coming around 10 o'clock next Sunday and <laughs> grabbing a cup of coffee before the service because there will probably be even more road closures than there are at the moment. Um, and we will start our service about five minutes early as well just so that we can have um, a two-minute silence at 11 o'clock as well. All of these things are on the notice sheet, so if you have one in your inbox or I think there may be some on the table, do grab those. The other extra things just to mention, um, next Saturday as well, there's a gardening work party at Barbara's house. Be please speak to Colin if you need to know more about that. And then on Sunday the 19th, we have a baptismal service in the afternoon. There is a sign-up sheet that is going in the front. Um, so do sign up for that if you are able to help with any of the catering. And please speak to Debbie Oldham um, if you need to know more information. I think... That is everything, unless anyone waves at me or heckles. Good, good. Um, so, yeah, do look at that note sheet. Do come and speak to someone if you need to hear any of those things again. Um, but it's good. There is so much going on and so much we can be bringing to the Lord in prayer as well. As we come to worship this morning, we are going to be thinking about who our God is and what a great God we have. Jesus is Lord. He is Lord of all. And this is what we read in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. There is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is this God, it is this Lord that we come to worship this morning. And our first song is Jesus is Lord, the cry that echoes through creation. We're going to stand and worship and sing this song together. After we've sung it, if you can please just remain standing and we'll commit our time of worship to God in prayer. So let's stand and worship together. Thank you. 
remain standing, let's pray and commit our time to the Lord. Oh Lord our God, we thank you that we can come and sing and say that Jesus is Lord. He is Lord over all creation. He is the, the firstborn from the dead. He is coming again and we thank you that as your people we, we can proclaim these truths. We can believe them because we know they are true. We ask, Lord, that by your Spirit you would meet with us this morning, that you would impress these truths on our hearts, that we would wonder at the God you are, that we would marvel at what you have done for us. Lord, meet with us this morning and glorify your name, we ask, because we pray these things in the name of our glorious and wonderful Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Do please be seated. As I said at the beginning, we're going to continue in the book of Galatians this morning, and we're coming to the final chapter. So if you do have your Bibles with you, do please turn to Galatians 6, and we will read the chapter together. Galatians chapter 6. Brothers... If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work. And then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will, from the Spirit, reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble. For I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. We thank God for his word and we look forward to Paul coming to preach from it in a a little while. Verse 14 that we read there. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a phrase that's taken up in our next hymn. It's how deep the Father's love for us. And we have that lovely line in there. I will not boast in anything save in the death of Christ my Lord. So let's remember these words as we stand and sing and worship again.
Well, in a moment, we're going to come to the Lord in prayer again and bring some of the needs of our church as we, we pray together. Um, but perhaps the only part of the notice sheet that I haven't mentioned already this morning is the, the section for prayer. And uh, I just really want to draw your attention to that now. And we'll take up some of these, these thoughts and requests as we do come to pray in a moment. And uh, we're asked particularly to pray for the care and nursing homes that we have a link with at Netley Christian Fellowship. Um, for many years, we've had the opportunity to go into those homes, both kind of on a monthly basis to hold services, but also on a more personal basis. And uh, Pat Webb has very much led that work for us, and Vincent has been uh, key in that work as well. And it, it's a great opportunity to, to go and share the gospel with those who may have heard it when they were younger and, and have been to Sunday school, or maybe to some who've, who've never heard the gospel before. It can be, be challenging because there's the, the difficulties of uh, physical illness and uh, the the mental health of many of the, the, um, the residents at these homes. But nonetheless, it is still wonderful to see God at work in their lives. Since COVID and during COVID, it has been very, very difficult to get back in. And uh, if, you, if you've spoken to Pat and Vincent about the homes, you'll know how difficult it has been to reestablish that contact as well. But we are thankful that uh, progress is being made and that we are finding our way back into those homes. And we're going to be praying particularly for Abbey House, uh, which is a nursing home that Vincent and Pat go into on a, on a weekly basis and speak to the residents there and where we've been able to hold uh, Christmas carol services before. And we're hoping that we can do that again. Uh, we're going to pray as well for the, for the Gables Care Home, where we go each month to hold services and uh, do pray for those, because uh, as I said, they can be a real challenge for the speakers. Um, but God can do amazing th things through his word. And also for Netley Court Care Home as well. We need to continue praying for the residents there. And Roz is visiting someone there and doing Bible studies. And we just pray that that, that link and uh, that relationship we have with the home there will continue to increase. So... We'll bring these things to the Lord now as we pray, but uh, during this week in your prayer times, do please pray particularly for the nursing homes in and around Netley. Do remember Roz and Vincent and Pat with all the work they do. Pray for those residents that the gospel would break through. Pray for the staff who, who often hear uh, what we are saying and, and hear the message as well. And pray as well for the, the exciting opportunity we have maybe coming next door as Revitalize is revitalized and uh, turned back into uh, another recuperation center. And we don't know what opportunities we may have and what the Lord may have in store for us there. Let us come to a great God then who knows all these things, who cares for each of his children. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our God. We thank you that we can come to you as our Heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord, that in your word you reveal yourself as a God who, who cares for his creation. Who cares for the world that he has made. We thank you that you are a God who has mercy on the weak. The helpless, Lord, for those who often society disregards. We thank you that we have a saviour in Jesus Christ who, who called the little children to himself. We thank you that in your word so often you tell us and you show yourself to be merciful to the fatherless and the widows. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunities we have as a church to reflect your love and mercy. And we pray, Lord, that by your spirit, you would help us to do that more and more. We thank you, Lord, that in a few moments, the children can go out and listen to great truths from your words. That they can hear in a way that they understand about who you are about how you have acted in history and how you are still acting today. 
We pray, Lord, for all those children that they would come to know you in their young age, that they would trust and believe that you are God and that Jesus Christ is their saviour. We pray for those teachers and helpers this morning, Lord, that you'd give them grace, that you'd give them the words to say, that you give them understanding as they, they speak with those children. But as we've been thinking and talking as well, Lord, we remember the, the elderly folk in the care and residential homes in and around Netley. We thank you for the opportunities we've had in the past to go in and, and share the gospel with these residents. And we thank you that those doors are opening up again. We pray, Lord, particularly for, for Pat and Vincent and Roz as they go in on such a regular basis. Again, Lord, that I pray that you would encourage them, that they would be able to see your spirit at work, that they would see the, the joy on the faces of those that they meet and talk with when they, they hear truths about you. Pray, Lord, that you would give them great wisdom and discernment as they speak into many difficult and challenging situations. And Lord, as we have an opportunity as a church to, to go into the homes, either for the, the carol services or, or monthly services, or maybe even to hold communion services, Lord, we pray that you would help each one who speaks. And that these opportunities would be used for the extension of your kingdom. Lord, often the, those residents can feel forgotten and abandoned. But we thank you that your word brings a message of hope, a message of reconciliation, news that there is a God in heaven who cares, that there is a saviour who has come. Lord, help us as your people to share this great news with those around us. We, we pray for the rooted group tonight as they consider this great topic of evangelism. Lord, give them that, that understanding of the gospel, that personal realization of what it means to be saved. But for them and for all of us, Lord, give us that, that passion to go and tell others of the great things our Savior has done for us. We have read already in your word, Lord, what, how pointless it is to, to boast in the things of ourself, to boast and, and to take glory in what we can do and who we think we are. And as we look at the world around us, Lord, we see the, the turmoil and, and sadness and chaos that comes from man's pride and greed. We ask, Lord, that through the message of the cross, that peace would come to troubled nations, that joy would come to broken lives. We pray for brothers and sisters, Lord, that perhaps may find it much more difficult to meet together than we do. For those, Lord, who are suffering persecution and hardship, Lord, we ask that you would raise them up, that you would strengthen them, that they would know your special grace this morning, we think of the church in Nigeria and we pray, Lord, for your believers there and ask that as we hear more about it this week, that we'd be able to pray with, um, with knowledge and with a burden on our hearts for your people there. Thank you for Hamada and Ruth and the work that they do. And ask, Lord, that you would just uphold them and use them in this faithful ministry. Lord, help us now as we come back to your word in a few moments. Speak to us, Lord. Help Paul as he comes and preaches. Lord, give him that liberty. Um, help him as he, he proclaims your word, Lord. By your spirit, move amongst us. Convict us. Convince us of your truth. That you would be glorified in our lives, we pray. Because we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's sing once more. And after this song, the young children can go out to the Sunday school and creche. 
and then Paul will come and preach to us. And our next hymn really is a prayer that the Lord would speak to us as we come to his word. It's speak, O Lord, as we come to you. Let's stand and sing together.
Thank you, Trevor, for leading us. We're going to be turning back to Paul's letter to the Galatians. And I'm going to look at the first six verses of chapter six. So I'll read those. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbour. For each will have to bear his own load. One who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. I want you to picture the scene, the, the day of the, the big family holiday has arrived and the suitcases are all packed, they've been weighed, every single one of them is 19.99 kilograms, we're okay there, they've been strapped and zipped and locked and labelled, it's all ready. And then of course if your household is anything like ours, about another 30 or 40 things suddenly appear which are essential for the holiday. What do you do with them? Well, of course, you end up stuffing them into hand luggage. I got caught out by this a little while ago at Gatwick when, having taken out all of the electronic devices from my hand luggage and put them in the tray and then put them on the conveyor belt, suddenly my bag was causing consternation amongst the customs officials as it went through the scanner I could see more and more officials gathering round the screen and more and more important officials gathering round the, the, the screen. And uh, my bag didn't come through. And when it did come through, I was called over and uh, they wanted to know what was in my bag. They told me afterwards that they thought I was carrying Semtex as uh, something had shown up in the scan that resembled plastic explosive. It turned out that it was a bag of Tesco granola bars <laughs> that Naomi had put into my rucksack because you can't go on holiday without granola. And I had become the unwitting muesli mule for the family. And I wonder if Galatians chapter 6 isn't a little bit like this. Is this the part of the letter where Paul is trying to squeeze in everything else that doesn't fit anywhere else? He's, to use my illustration, he's packed his suitcases really well in chapters 1 through 5. It's the most carefully arranged, brilliantly executed defense of the gospel. We're saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and all he's done for us. But then suddenly he seems... At least at first sight, as you get to chapter 6, frantically and randomly be throwing a whole load of things that he wanted to say into the hand luggage of the epistle. Verse 1, he's now talking about how you can help backsliders. Verse 6, don't forget to pay your pastor. Verse 10, be nice to everyone, especially to the church. Lots of love, Paul. Or is it more joined up than this? Is this part of the wonderful flow of Paul's letter to the Galatians? And I'm pretty sure it is. I don't want you to understand what's been happening in this letter. Because by the time we get to chapter 6, don't you think there were going to be some pretty broken and bruised people in the Galatian church? Paul hasn't held back, has he, in five chapters on his attacks on the legalists who were saying that Jesus wasn't enough and your works are necessary to really save you. He's held anathemas around. He opened the letter, didn't he? You idiots of Galatia. He's told the circumcision party that he wishes that they would just go and castrate themselves. And... uh, 
I think that there are going to be some people who, when they've heard the first five chapters of Galatians, would have just stormed out of the church because the gospel has exposed them. They don't like it, and they're angry. But there are other people in the church who've been taken in by false teaching. They're going to be feeling bruised, aren't they? And broken, and sad, and convicted. And then, of course, there are going to be other people in the church who never fell for the false teaching. They stayed loyal to the Apostle Paul's teaching. And they're going to be feeling smug, aren't they? And they will be thinking, and they're about to say the four most unhelpful words in history. I told you so. Well... Paul, skilled pastor of the years, has anticipated that at the end of chapter 5, verses 25 and 26, which acts, if you look at it, as a bridge into chapter 6, shows that this is really all connected. At the end of that chapter, he said, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. When we see it like that, now chapter 6 isn't just random stuff that's been thrown together and it's not going to be the playground in which the spiritually conceited can lord it over the fallen. This is going to now be how with humility and love and gentleness, verse 1, that great fruit of the Spirit he's just been talking about, they can help one another as a proper church. Paul isn't interested only in winning arguments. He's done that so powerfully in chapters 1 through 5. But he wants to win people as well, especially his fallen brothers and sisters. And he wants to see them restored, and that's what the gospel does. And chapter 6 is the the real outworking of the rest of the epistle now in our lives, in spirit-filled lives. And I think Paul brings three things to our attention here. Firstly, there is social responsibility. Secondly, there is personal scrutiny. And then thirdly, there'll be divine accountability. Now, you might be thinking, I don't like those words. Responsibility, scrutiny, accountability. I liked it when you were talking Galatians 5 about freedom. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Well, he has but he set us free to be the people he wants us to be. He set us free to be those who will now bear the image of the Lord Jesus Christ and be the ones in whom the Spirit uh, produces his fruit as we serve in love. So let's come to the text and let it do all the work. First of all, you've got social responsibility. Just please let your eyes scan over verses 1 to 10 And you will see a whole gallery of people that we have a responsibility toward. Verse 1, you've got the fallen. Verse 2, you've got the struggling. Verse 6, you've got those who are dependent on you, those working full-time for the church. Now, if you really want to get rid of your pastor, you don't have to just wait till the church meeting. You can starve us out if you want. But hopefully you won't do that. Paul says there are people who are dependent on you as those who are taught. Then verse 10, you've got everyone. Verse 10b, you've got especially your brothers and sisters in the church. Now, I want my focus to be under this first heading on those first two groups this morning, the fallen and the struggling. So we've got those who have fallen, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. I've suggested that almost certainly in Paul's mind there is a Galatian context here. But I think it's bigger than just the Galatian situation. In past weeks, we've all seen enough of the struggle that we have with the works of the flesh, haven't we? We've been honest about that, that, you know, it's a battle in our lives that we can still fall and we do fall. This is a live issue within the life of any church in any of our lives. 
So here's the situation. Someone has been caught in transgression. Oh, when Paul uses the word caught here, I don't want you to think of a, a honey trap that's been set, like John chapter 8, where they bring in the woman who's been caught in the act of adultery, the very act. It's a setup. Or in, I don't know, maybe we put the GoPros up in the kitchen at the back to try to work out who's been taking two jammy dodgers. And uh, we catch them. We say, you've been caught in the very act. You're banged to rights. Well, no, the Greek word here has the idea of being overtaken by sin, being seized by it, being mugged by transgression. And this word transgression is, is carefully chosen here. It, it means to step aside. It comes from the word that we get peripatetic, to walk and this person is now walking in the wrong way. They're trespassing. And that ties in really well with what Paul has told us that we ought to do in chapter 5, verse 16, which was walk by the Spirit. And when you do that, he says you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. But here is a brother or a sister, and it could be you, and it could be me. We've got an out of step with the Spirit and our defences are down, we're not being watchful, and sin is hiding in that darkened doorway down the street. You remember the, the Lord's words to Cain, that sin crouches at the door, and its desire is for you, it's waiting to pounce. And here it's seized a person, Oh, read your Bibles. There are not many of the heroes or the heroines of the faith who at some point or many points of their lives haven't been grasped hold of by sin and mugged by it. And this poor person feels they've made an absolute mess of everything. So what are we supposed to do? Well, we could ask, what do we do? And sometimes we, we just abdicate responsibility, don't we? And we, we pass by on the other side of the road. And we think, that's not my problem. Or we, we, we murmur the second most fatuous words of human history. Someone ought to do something about that. And I think Paul is saying, yes, they should, and it could be you. Or, or we can tell everybody else about what a, what a terrible, shocking mess so-and-so has made of their life. Or we can storm in in a blazing temper, anything other than a spirit of gentleness. And oh, we've probably all done this, I have. Instead of reaching for the oil of grace to wash wounds, we've reached the oil of high octane gasoline. We poured that on the situation and we've made it ten times worse. Or we, we could, and we should, do what Paul says here which is exactly what Jesus would do. We could seek to restore someone in a spirit of gentleness. That's a lovely thing to do. Now, I don't want you to end up going around everybody and trying to work out what's wrong with them. Uh, Paul is not causing, calling us to a, a ministry of interference here. There are so many ministries that I've discovered in the church that I've never discovered in the New Testament. There is the ministry of discouragement and the ministry of moaning and the ministry of nitpitting, constantly picking up our brothers and sisters over the minutiae of their lives. Actually, that one is in the New Testament. Jesus spoke about it. It was the, the ministry of the gnat strainers and the camel swallowers. But he didn't put it in a very good light. But there is a wonderful ministry of restoration, which is so necessary. And who can do this? Well, look at your text. Paul says it is the spiritual. So we're all looking around. Where are they? Have they got a big badge on that says the spiritual? Or... If they've got a big badge on that says, the spiritual, give them a wide berth. 
Or is it the, the people who have been to theological college? Well, maybe, but I can assure you, having been to theological college, that going to theological college by itself doesn't make you spiritual. Paul tells us that knowledge by itself puffs us up. It's love that edifies. And this is the exciting thing, is the spiritual should be all of you. Those of you who are walking by the Spirit, who are seeing in your lives the evidence of his fruit of love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Here are people who want not to put people in their place, but to set people back on their feet. This word restore is a medical term in Greek. It's to set a broken bone back so that it heals well and strongly. And I think it's lovely, isn't it, that Paul emphasizes gentleness at this point. Those of you who are competent, he might have said, or you can do this with a a spirit of, of, uh, I don't know, competence, but no gentleness is what mattered here. Why do you think it's the gentle who are so good at doing this? Don't don't you think it's because they know how much it hurts? Because they've probably been through this before themselves and they're still bearing the scars? Don't you think that's why Peter is just such a wonderful, lovely pastor in the New Testament? Because he's learned gentleness, because he's been through pain. There's no coincidence that John Mark ends up with Peter. I know he ends up with Barnabas first, but we think Barnabas dies on the island of Crete. And John Mark, who has been mugged by sin, who has started to walk away from the apostles, who has abandoned them at that point, ends up with Peter who knows how to put people back together because he's learnt it from Jesus in his own life. And he's gentle. And Peter, at the end of his first epistle, can talk about Mark, my son. And Paul, at the end of his life, is is asking for, for John Mark to come back because he's so useful. This is a lovely, lovely verse. When when I was reading the commentators this week, they spend pages and pages talking about church discipline at this point. Now, that's a really important subject, but it isn't what Paul's talking about here, is it? And if Paul's words were heeded by the spiritual in the church and by us when we fall, then we wouldn't get to the stage of church discipline. And having to tell it to the church, because inconspicuously from earth's perspective, but in the full view of heaven's perspective, brothers and sisters will be picking one another up and setting them on their feet again. And heaven would be rejoicing over that. Secondly, we've got the struggling. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. There are so many burdens in this room this morning. And they're crushing people. The word that Paul uses for burden is is baros, from which we get barometer, an instrument that measures pressure and the weight of the atmosphere. I tell you that not just to peddle my scanty knowledge of Greek, but because you're going to need it in a little while if you look down the text when you think Paul has contradicted himself. And I'm going to show you he hasn't. But he's saying here, bear one another's weighty burdens. For there's, there's something in many of us that thinks, I, I don't want to be the church bellhop. I'm not going to be the porter for the rest of you. I can't carry everybody's burdens. And anyway, didn't Peter write that we should cast all our cares on God because God cares for us? Well, you're you're right. You can't carry everyone's burdens. Only Jesus can do that. 
You're right, God did tell us to cast our cares on him because he cares for us. But he loves to minister that care through his church, doesn't he? Because that glorifies him. And I think he has organized churches quite skillfully from heaven. And there ought to be enough shoulders in each church to bear up the weight of those who are weighed down. We've got the spiritual burdens that we've already mentioned, people who've fallen and are crushed this morning. What about family pressures? The burden of bringing up young children, maybe of being a single mum or a single dad. The burden of having wayward children, of frail relatives. The burdens of financial hardship, of health breakdowns, of mental breakdowns. The burdens of bereavement, of immobility, of loneliness, abandonment, addiction. The burdens of work life, family life, marriage, church life. There are so many burdens. And perhaps you're thinking, I'm at breaking point myself. I don't need to hear this about carrying other people's burdens this morning. How does this verse help me? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? Sometimes we need brothers and sisters to help carry our load. And whilst we probably, all of us, don't mind being a spiritual porter some of the time, we're not so good at accepting help from others, are we? Last summer, we just landed in, in Agadir Airport in Morocco. Sorry, this is sounding a bit like my holiday vlog, isn't it? But we just landed in, in Agadir Airport in, in Morocco, and, uh, and this young man appeared out of nowhere. He grabbed Naomi's case, and uh, he was attempting to grab my case as well. And once I'd worked out he wasn't trying to steal them, uh, he was wanting to carry them for us. And uh, I, I was very reluctant to, to let go of mine because I knew he'd want a tip at the end of it. I've learned enough about portering to know that there are things that transcend language. And there are only two gestures you really need to know. There is that, which means give it to me, and that, which means give it to me. And I was holding on to my case, and he was trying to grab my case. And I thought I was able to trump him at this point. And I, I said to him, I don't have any Moroccan dirham to give to you. And he smiled at me, and he said, it's okay. I love sterling. <laughs> Sadly, he didn't accept granola. I could have paid him handsomely with that. But we can be like that in church life as well. Not because we're tight, like I am, but because we're proud. And we don't want to accept help. We see that as weakness. But it's okay to be weak. We're all going through different seasons of life. Sometimes we can carry, sometimes we need to be carried. But what matters is, I think, that we're close to each other, that we know each other, that we have real fellowship with one another, so that we can not just pray for each other, but we can pray with each other and help and be helped. You can't know everybody in the life of the church. That's why, as a church, we're trying to establish smaller small groups so that we can spiritually and prayerfully bless one another as we do what Paul says here, which is fulfill the law of Christ. We love one another as he's loved us. I'd urge you, even if you can't regularly attend one of those small groups, be a part of it so that there will be people who know when you're going through difficult times and you'll know when they are and you can help one another. Secondly, don't worry, I'm much, much shorter on these last two points. I got carried away there. But it's important. Secondly, there is self-scrutiny. We can't pass over our responsibilities to be our brothers and our sisters' keeper, but we can't do that unless we keep watch over our own selves. Verse 1, lest we be tempted. And it really comes out again in verse 3, for if anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing he deceives himself we ought to know ourselves and knowing ourselves should make us so dependent on Jesus and his grace 
we're not to think, verse 1, well, I'm too strong to fall like this person did. That won't happen to me. Or verse 2, 3, I'm too important to serve. Or I'm too proud to be served because, Paul says, you think you're something. Well, you are something if you think like that. You're a self-deluded car crash waiting to happen. By nature, we are nothings. We've achieved nothing. We deserve nothing. We can do nothing. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Not quite as much, but nothing. And it's only by grace that we become something, which is sons and daughters of the living God, clothed in his righteousness, forgiven through his blood, heirs of the promise, kings and queens in waiting. But it's all been grace, not our works. Now, please, when I talk about self-scrutiny, don't get into morose, obsessive navel-gazing that just leaves you completely paralyzed and ends up causing you to be narcissistic because you're so wrapped up with yourself. But self-scrutiny involves daily doses of realism as we listen to God's word and we look into its mirror. And when I do that, it shows me constantly how much I need Jesus. As I get older, I realize I need him more and more. Every step I take is, chapter 5, to be taken in step with the Spirit. Every new morning that dawns, I thank him for mercies that are new, because I need them. And faithfulness, which is great, because without that faithfulness, I'm going to fall. The end of every day finishes with, Lord, forgive me my debt. I'm pretty sure the last cry of my life will be, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And the greatest moment of my life will be when he takes me and presents me faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. And we'll worship him for what? For grace. That's done it all for us and all the glory belongs to Jesus. Self-scrutiny should make us rejoice in God's wonderful grace towards us. A gospel that takes those who are nothings and is able to make them something. But then finally, we've got divine accountability. This will be properly developed next time in the the next part of the the, the text, verses 7 through 10, where you get sowing and reaping. We won't deal with that this morning. But it's there in verse 4. Let each one test his own work. And then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each one will have to bear his own load. Now, this is the point where you possibly should be thinking Paul's contradicted himself. Because he said, bear each other's burdens. And now he says, each one should carry his own load. So I want you to get the barometer out again. Verse 2 was baros. It was a heavy weight. Verse 5 is a totally different word. It's a word that was used of a knapsack. It's a lot smaller than bearing the weight of the atmosphere, isn't it? It would be given to a soldier that he would carry. And actually, it's the word that Matthew uses in chapter 11 of his gospel, verse 30, when Jesus says to you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we should not translate that word as burden in Matthew 11.30. The only translation that got it right was the good news version. I was surprised about that. It should be translated load. It is a light load that Jesus gives us to carry and tells us that that's what we must shoulder. It's a load he gives to you which is loaded with grace. A burden that unburdens you. And what Paul's saying here is that you're not going to be tested against how poorly you think your neighbor did. And how well you were doing in comparison to them. That's that's an easy thing to do in life. 
you find some people who are obvious heretics and you stand next to them. You look fantastic, don't you? And Paul says that isn't how God is going to assess your life. He's going to say, well, what, did, what did you do? What did you do with the light load that Jesus entrusted to you? What did you do with the talents that he gave to you, not with the talents that he gave to other people? Are you growing in grace and in the knowledge of him? Is that fruit of the Spirit growing and maturing, even little by little as we come through another year? Is the gospel bearing fruit in our lives week by week? I think it is. But all of that can leave us feeling inadequate and fearful, the thought of standing before God and looking at ourselves. And so I'll go back to where I always go. And it's where Paul's heading in Galatians chapter 6 as you get to the end. Trevor chose that hymn because... I think he just wanted to get there so badly. <laughs> and we will get there. But it's where Paul would have taken us if he was just preaching verses 1 through 6. Jesus Christ and his cross. That's what makes the difference. And our eyes have got to be fixed on him. As he's calling us through this life of faith, he's not telling us to do anything that he hasn't first done for us, is he? Think of all the things we've gone through this morning. Who, who was the great gentle restorer? of fallen people. You won't find the greatest in this room. You find the greatest, the one that the people in this room worship. He was Jesus who didn't snap bruised reeds or extinguish smoking wicks, who whilst never excusing sin or making light of it, forgave sinners and mended them and restored the broken and called them to follow him in lives of love. Who is the, the mighty burden bearer? Well, it's not a person in this room who's carrying all the burdens. It's Jesus, isn't it? Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden with your weights and your burdens of guilt and sin and shame and failure and the pressures you can't carry. And I will give you rest. Who is it who not only wrote the law of Christ, but fulfilled it when he loved us first and then told us to love each other? It's Jesus. Who is the only one who really was something and yet made himself nothing that he might save us? Who is the one who calls us to him and puts his yoke on our shoulders, not to weigh us down, but to join us to him and then hands us a load which is light? It's this wonderful life that Paul is calling us to a life of union with Christ, a fellowship with his spirit, keeping in step with him until Christ is formed in us. And that's what makes church beautiful. It's the only thing that makes church attractive is Jesus present in the word, by the spirit, in the life of his people. But I can't close without just applying this to those of you who don't know Jesus yet because I've been talking mainly to, to Christians this morning, but it's this same Lord Jesus who now comes to you in the gospel. and He can make you new. He came to save sinners who were lost and helpless and mugged by sin, pinned down by it. And he overpowered it. He prized open its jaws that he might rescue you and lift you. He made himself nothing in order to make you something. He went to the cross by himself to give up his life as a ransom payment to bring you out of darkness into a wonderful new family, into his church, who, if they've been listening to me this morning, carefully and prayerfully, will now love you as their own and will care for you as their own. And they'll do everything to see you grow so that you can then start loving and supporting and caring others as you go through life. Well, before we come to the table, let's sing Beneath the Cross of Jesus. <laughs>